Okay, good day, everyone. Uh, welcome, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Danny Weiss. I'm a neonatologist at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center uh, in Toronto, and I'm joined by my co-moderator, Dr. Rachel Highland, who's a neonatal intensivist at uh, Iowa, at Steve Family Iowa Children's Hospital. Um, we're pleased to moderate to you today the Pan American Hemodynamics Collaborative uh, bi-monthly webinar series with an all-star cast, uh, all-star speaker, and all-star cast of panelists. It's absolutely going to be a fantastic uh, talk and discussion today. Um, and a warm uh, welcome again to everyone and a kind reminder that if you do have questions for either our speaker or any of our panelists who are about to be introduced shortly by Dr. Highland, please do put them in the Q&A. Um, this is a, uh, um, a seminar dedicated, of course, to uh, the field of hemodynamics, uh, and we have a a panel, a panelist, uh, uh, sorry, a set of panelists and speaker with a very vast array of experience and expertise. Um, the I'll hand this, things over to Dr. Hyland now for uh, for introductions. Thank you so much. Yes, very excited about our group today, and I have the pleasure to introduce first our panelists. So I'll start with Dr. Nidhi Varghese, who's a practicing pediatric pulmonologist and the medical director of the Texas Children's Hospital Pulmonary Hypertension Center. So her interests lie not only in pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary vascular disease, complications of dolent developmental lung disease, also bronchopulmonary dysplasia and sickle cell disease. Next, we have Dr. Craig Fleischman. He's a pediatric cardiologist who specializes in echocardiography. He's the co-director of the Heart Center at Orlando Health Arnold Palmer, Palmer Hospital for Children and the director of non-invasive cardiac imaging. His research interests center in therapeutic approaches to congenital heart disease and fetal cardiac diagnostic imaging. And then finally, we have Dr. Neil Patel, who is a neonatologist at the Royal Hospital for Children in Glasgow. He has clinical and research interests in neonatal, neonatal hemodynamic assessment and management, including pulmonary hypertension and CDH patients. He leads active collaborations within international CDH research groups, including the International CDH Study Group and the Euro CDH Consortium. And then finally, I get to introduce our wonderful speaker, um, Dr. Ashling Smith. Um, she completed her specialist training in neonatology in Ireland in 2023 and is now completing a neonatology fellowship additionally at King's College in London. And in 2021, she completed a National Children's Hospital Foundation funded PhD um, encompassing prospective observational studies of myocardial function and pulmonary hemodynamics in various neonatal populations, including infants born with Down syndrome, infants conceived through assisted reproductive techniques, and and infants born to mothers with gestational diabetes. We're really looking forward to your talk, um, Dr. Smith, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, I'm thrilled to be with you today. Um, so I will share my slides. Can everyone see my slides okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. So I'll begin. So um, as I've been introduced, I'm currently working in London, um, but this work was done as part of my PhD in the Rotunda Hospital in Dublin in Ireland under Professor Fief al -Kafash. So as discussed, I'll be chatting about heart function and pulmonary vascular disease in children with Down syndrome. So with regards to the talk outline, I'm going to go through and discuss the main physiological concepts behind the mechanisms of pulmonary hypertension in babies with Down syndrome discuss how the myocardium adapts in neonates with Down syndrome, discuss the impact of diastolic dysfunction on the evolution of pulmonary hypertension in babies with Down syndrome, and also discuss the longitudinal data available on pulmonary hypertension and myocardial function in babies and children with Down syndrome. So let's dive in. So Down syndrome, as we know, is the most common chromosomal abnormality of live-born babies globally. And the estimated incidence of Down syndrome worldwide is one in 700 newborns. However, in Ireland, it's, in, it's one in 546 live births, which is the highest rate in Europe. And we know that the cardiovascular system of babies with Down syndrome is characterized by pulmonary hypertension and biventricular dysfunction over the early neonatal period. And it's becoming increasingly known that pulmonary hypertension is prevalent in babies with Down syndrome, both with and without congenital heart disease, although the underlying etiology and the timing of presentation may be different between those two groups. With regards to the clinical implications and the incidence of pulmonary hypertension in Down syndrome, pulmonary hypertension in the early newborn period in the Down syndrome population is associated with increased necessity for invasive ventilation, prolonged inhaled nitric oxide therapy, 
longer hospital admissions and a higher mortality before discharge when compared to the general neonatal population. The incidence of pulmonary hypertension was originally estimated to lie between 27 and 34%. However, this was likely to be an underestimation as it was based off retrospective studies that utilized an amalgamation of clinical and echocardiographic diagnostic criteria. So in 2022, we published the results of our three-year prospective observational study of 70 infants with Down syndrome in comparison to 60 controls in which we assess the evolution of pulmonary hemodynamics and myocardial performance over their first two years of age. And I performed echoes on all babies on day one, day two, between day three and five, six months, 12 months, and 24 months of age. In our study, a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension over the first week of age was made if two or more of the pulmonary hypertension markers defined as follows were present a pulmonary artery acceleration time less than 40 milliseconds, a PAATI less than 0.25, in the presence of a PDA, the demonstration of bidirectional or right to left flow, and a left ventricular eccentricity index, left ventricular eccentricity index greater than 1.8. So by these criteria on day one of age, 84% of babies with Down syndrome met the criteria for pulmonary hypertension in comparison to 15% of controls. With regards to the etiology of pulmonary hypertension in Down syndrome, it is heterogeneous and it results from multiple overlapping etiologies. We know that people with Down syndrome have specific anatomical, physiological and genetic tendencies that place them at increased risk of developing pulmonary hypertension in their early newborn period or early pulmonary hypertension or at an older age with the evolution of pulmonary vascular disease, which is termed late pulmonary hypertension. However, a clinically relevant approach to diagnosis and management considers the on timing of onset and the underlying pathogenesis of pulmonary hypertension as an aberrant process of lung development. In discussing early pulmonary hypertension or delayed postnatal circulatory transition and the etiology of this, we know that babies with Down syndrome are born with structural anomalies of lung tissue, including decreased number of alveoli, decreased number of alveoli in relation to asini, subpleural cysts and decreased vessel density. It's also been shown that lung tissue from fetuses with Down syndrome overexpress anti-angiogenic factors, and this could lead to impaired pulmonary vascular growth, which may in turn negatively impact alveolar growth, therefore contributing to their pulmonary hypertension phenotype. When, when discussing late pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary hypertension that evolves past the first few weeks of age, in contrast to early pulmonary hypertension associated with delayed transition post-birth, late pulmonary hypertension in children with Down syndrome is characterized by sustained and often progressive elevation of pulmonary arterial pressures that is diagnosed beyond the first few weeks of age. And late pulmonary hypertension may occur in individuals originally diagnosed with early pulmonary hypertension during their early neonatal period. But importantly, it can often develop in babies or children with Down syndrome with initially successful postnatal transition that never manifested early pulmonary hypertension. It's likely that some of the mechanisms of late pulmonary hypertension are superimposed on the aforementioned congenital abnormalities of respiratory tissue and lung anti-angiogenic anti factor expression. But other late pulmonary hypertension etiologies are linked to congenital heart disease. Of course, we know that up to 50% of babies born with Down syndrome will have some form of congenital heart disease. So these babies may be exposed to persistent systemic to pulmonary shunts with increased pulmonary blood flow, sleep disordered breathing and chronic hypoxemia. We're aware that babies, uh, people with Down syndrome, um, between 30 and 75% of these individuals suffer from sleep disordered breathing. People with Down syndrome have upper airway obstructions, and this is because of a number of reasons, including mid-face hypoplasia, microgonathia, and generalized hypotonia. People with Down syndrome have altered immune function, such as decreased number of leukocytes, lymphocytes, and monocytes, as well as impaired maturation of T lymphocytes. And this places them at increased risk of all infections, but particularly relevant in the context of pulmonary hypertension is recurrent respiratory illness with repeated upper and lower respiratory tract infections, which may exacerbate evolving pulmonary hypertension. Again, people with Down syndrome are at increased risk of gastroesophageal reflux and an increased risk of aspiration. 
and pulmonary hemosiderosis can present with a more severe course in Down syndrome. So taken together, a complex interplay between structural, genetic and immunological deficiency exists in people with Down syndrome, which can result in the evolution of both acute and chronic pulmonary hypertension. So part two, how does the myocardium in people with Down syndrome adapt to, to the presence of pulmonary hypertension? So the challenge for the right ventricle and left ventricle in children with Down syndrome is to, is to remain hemodynamically coupled to their respective circulations. Firstly, discussing right ventricular pulmonary vascular coupling or RVPV coupling. So initially, the right ventricle will adapt to increasing vascular load by enhancing its contractility to maintain pulmonary blood flow. And it achieves this via myocardial hypertrophy. However, in time, with prolonged exposure to increased pulmonary vascular resistance and progressive pressure loading on the ORV, this can lead to maladaptive ventricular remodeling. And this can result in right ventricular dilatation with a subsequent decrease in stroke volume and the heart rate increases in order to maintain the cardiac output. In time, right ventricular systolic and diastolic dysfunction due to ORV dilatation ensues, and this can lead to decreased stroke volume and an overall reduction in cardiac output. The left ventricle is also impacted because LV filling may be affected by ORV dilatation and the septal bowing, with varying degrees of left ventricular dysfunction manifesting due to the phenomenon of interventricular dependence. So this graph summarizes this. So under normal conditions in green, the ORV is placed under a reasonable amount or a normal amount of afterload and ORV-PV coupling is maintained. However, if there's an increase in ORV afterload, the ORV responds by becoming hypertrophied in order to increase its contractility. And in the yellow zone, ORV-PV coupling is still maintained because of these adaptations. However, in the face of unrem unremitting increases in pulmonary vascular resistance and the ORV afterload it brings, the ORV becomes dilated, it becomes dysfunctional, and ORV PV uncoupling ensues as per in the red zone. And when we're in the red zone, there's an associated decrease in right ventricular function. So moving on to diastolic dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension in babies with Down syndrome. So prior to our group's work, the presence of left ventricular diastolic impairment and its relationship with pulmonary hypertension in the neonatal Down syndrome population was unexplored. So as mentioned, we had 70 babies with Down syndrome versus 60 controls, and we assessed their heart function and pulmonary hemodynamics over their first week of age with echoes performed on day one, two, and between day three and five of age. And this work has been published in the Journal of Pediatrics. Of note, 69% of babies in the Down syndrome cohort had some form of congenital heart disease. However, there was no difference detected between the Down syndrome congenital heart disease and Down syndrome no congenital heart disease groups across any of the three echo-derived surrogates of pulmonary hypertension, namely pulmonary artery acceleration time, the PAATI, or the left ventricular eccentricity index at any time point over the study period. When we looked at echo surrogates of pulmonary hypertension over the first week of age, these graphs display the babies with Down syndrome in red and the babies who were in the control group in blue. So what you see on the top left is the pulmonary artery acceleration time, and PAAT is inversely correlated with pulmonary vascular resistance, meaning lower values of PAAT are indicating higher pulmonary vascular resistance. So what you see here is persistently lower values of the PAAT over the first week of age in the Down syndrome cohort in comparison to controls. We also saw significantly lower values of PAAT to ORVET ratio, and significantly higher values of the left ventricular eccentricity index over the first week of age in the Down syndrome cohort. Taken together, all of these markers indicate significantly higher pulmonary vascular resistance in the Down syndrome cohort in comparison to controls that do not normalize by hospital discharge. As mentioned previously, by using our criteria of pulmonary hypertension, on day one, 84% of babies with Down syndrome met that criteria in comparison to 15% of controls. And by day three of age, 28% of babies still met that criteria for pulmonary hypertension in comparison to 0% of the controls. Next, looking at biventricular performance over the first week of age. 
on the top left, you can see left ventricular global longitudinal strain. And what we see is persistently lower values of LV strain in the Down syndrome cohort over the first week of age. We also saw significantly lower values of left ventricular systolic strain rate values in the Down syndrome group persistently over the first week of age, and notably persistently lower values of left ventricular early diastolic strain rate measurements in the Down syndrome group in comparison to controls over their first week of age. On assessment of right ventricular function, what we saw was persistently lower values of ORV free wall strain measurements in our Down syndrome group, persistently and significantly lower values of ORV systolic strain rate measurements in our Down syndrome group, and also persistently lower right ventricular early diastolic strain rate measurements in the Down syndrome group in comparison to controls over the first week of age. So taken together, we saw persistent biventricular early diastolic impairment in the Down syndrome group, as exhibited by significantly lower left and right ventricular early diastolic strain rate values over the first week of age in comparison to controls. We wanted to evaluate the relationship between left ventricular diastolic impairment and pulmonary hypertension over the first week of age. And what we saw was left ventricular early diastolic strain rate was independently associated with both pulmonary artery acceleration time and the PAATI while controlling for gestational age, cesarean delivery, and the presence of congenital heart disease. Next, we investigated the correlation between left ventricular diastolic impairment and pulmonary hypertension in infants with Down syndrome over their first week of age. On the top graphs, again, the babies with Down syndrome are in red and the babies in the control group are in blue. On the top two graphs here, what you see is the correlate between left ventricular early diastolic strain rate and the PAAT, and the left ventricular early diastolic strain rate and the PAAT to ORVT ratio. <clears throat> excuse me. And what you can see is that there's a significant positive, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, a significant positive correlation between left ventricular early diastolic strain rate and the PAAT and the PAAT to ORVT ratio. So this demonstrates that with worse diastolic function, there's a direct correlation with higher indices of pulmonary hypertension in the Down syndrome cohort. On the bottom graphs, we see the correlation between the EE ratio and the PAAT, and the EE ratio and the PAAT to ORVT ratio. And just to remind you that the EE ratio provides an estimate of left atrial filling pressure with higher values indicating elevated left atrial pressures. So what the bottom graphs are telling us is that there was a significant negative correlation between the EE ratio and the PAT and the EE ratio and the PAT to ORVET ratio, demonstrating that with higher left atrial filling pressures, there was also a direct correlation with higher indices of pulmonary hypertension in the Down syndrome cohort. We next assess the correlation between pulmonary hypertension and the ORV systolic function in babies with Down syndrome on day one. On the top graphs, we see the correlation between the PAAT measurements and the ORV free wall strain and the PAAT and the ORV systolic strain rate. What we clearly see is a po significant positive correlation between PAAT measurements and the ORV free wall strain and the ORV systolic strain rate. On the bottom graphs, we see the correlate between the left ventricular eccentricity index and the right ventricular free wall strain and the right ventricular systolic strain rate. And again, there was a significant negative correlation between the left ventricular eccentricity index measurements and the ORV free wall strain and ORV systolic strain rate measurements. Taken together, it's telling us that the higher the pulmonary vascular resistance, the, the, that there was a direct correlate with lower measures of right ventricular systolic function. Next, and finally, we wanted to look at the correlation between left ventricular diastolic impairment and ORV-PV coupling in babies with Down syndrome over their first week of age. And what we see here is a significant positive correlate between left ventricular early diastolic strain rate and ORV-PV coupling. And this tells us that, that there's a direct correlation between worse indices of left ventricular early diastolic function and worse ORV-PV coupling. So what's the physiological mechanism for this? What we propose is that babies with Down syndrome have decreased left ventricular diastolic function. They have stiffer left ventricles. 
This is leading to an increased left atrial pressure environment. This in turn, with back pressure into the pulmonary vascular system, may lead to pulmonary venous hypertension, contributing to increased pulmonary vascular resistance, and in turn negatively impacting on the ORV afterload environment and the systolic ORV performance. Of course, we wanted to mitigate for any confounders. So to mitigate the potentially confounding effect of prematurity and congenital heart disease in the Down syndrome group, we performed subgroup analysis of babies with Down syndrome born less than 37 weeks versus greater than 37 weeks gestation. Babies with congenital heart disease in comparison to without congenital heart disease. And what we saw was there were no differences in any of the LV or ORV anthropometric or functional measurements or markers of pulmonary vascular resistance in infants with Down syndrome with gestational ages less than 37 weeks or greater than 37 weeks. In addition, with the exception of right ventricular length, which was longer in the Down syndrome congenital heart disease group, there was no difference in any of the LV, ORV, anthropometric or functional measurements or PVOR markers between babies with Down syndrome with or without congenital heart disease. And of note, there were 20 babies born with Down syndrome, born at a gestation greater than, 20, greater than 37 weeks without congenital heart disease. And the differences in LV and ORV myocardial performance and PVOR markers remain significant between this group and the control group over the first week of age. So finally, the longitudinal assessment of pulmonary hemodynamics and myocardial function in infants with Down syndrome. Prior to our work, there was a dearth of longitudinal data describing the evolution of myocardial performance and pulmonary hemodynamics in infants with Down syndrome, both with and without congenital heart disease over their first two years of age. In the study, we included the 70 babies with Down syndrome versus the 60 controls, and I assessed them over their first two years of age, with echoes at six months, 12 months, and 24 months of age. Firstly, looking at our assessment of pulmonary vascular resistance measurements, in these graphs, the controls are still in blue. Babies with Down syndrome and no congenital heart disease are in red, and babies with Down syndrome and congenital heart disease are in green. What you see on the left graph is the PAAT to ORVET ratio measurement. And what you see here is it is persistently lower values of this measurement of PVOR in comparison to controls in both Down syndrome groups over the first two years of age. This finding was mirrored on our assessments of left ventricular eccentricity index with persistently higher values in both Down syndrome groups in comparison to controls over the first two years of age. So what this demonstrates is that babies with Down syndrome, regardless of the presence or absence of structural cardiac disease, have ongoing elevated pulmonary vascular resistance in comparison to a control cohort that does not normalize by two years of age. On our assessments of left ventricular function, on the top left, we see that both groups of babies with Down syndrome have persistently lower left ventricular global longitudinal strain values in comparison to controls at all time points assessed over the first two years of age. We also saw persistently and significantly lower values of left ventricular systolic strain rate values in both Down syndrome groups until one year of age, and persistently lower LV systolic strain rate values in babies with Down syndrome and congenital heart disease in comparison to controls at two years of age. On assessment of early diastolic function, what we see is persistently lower values of LV early diastolic strain rate at birth and six months of age in both Down syndrome groups in comparison to controls. And at 12 months and two years of age, persistently lower LV early diastolic strain rate measurements in the babies with Down syndrome and congenital heart disease in comparison to controls at those time points. On assessment of right ventricular function over the first two years of age, what we saw on the top left here is persistently lower ORV free wall systolic strain measurements at birth, six months and 12 months of age in both Down syndrome groups in comparison to controls and ongoing significantly lower ORV free wall strain in babies with Down syndrome and congenital heart disease at two years of age in comparison to controls. We saw persistently lower values of ORV systolic strain rate measurements in both groups of babies with Down syndrome in comparison to controls 
up until 12 months of age. And with regards to ORV early diastolic strain rate, we saw persistently lower values of, of this measurement at 12 months of age in comparison to controls in both groups of babies with Down syndrome. So in summary, our findings indicate that infants with Down syndrome have persistent abnormal elevation of PVR over the first two years of age, regardless of the presence or absence of structural cardiac disease. We saw sustained biventricular systolic and diastolic impairment in the Down syndrome cohort. Both LV and or V strain and systolic strain rate values were negatively affected in the Down syndrome group in comparison to controls. And this suggests a combination of abnormal loading conditions and impaired inherent contractility. There's limited data regarding the biological underpinnings of such observations. A 1986 study of 15 individuals with Down syndrome with without congenital heart disease against 15 age and sex matched controls demonstrated that the average weights of hearts in the Down syndrome group was 79% of the control values. And a murine model of trisomy 21 revealed that the quadriceps femoris skeletal fibers displayed structural alterations of their mitochondria and myonuclei, similar to those documented in age-related sarcopenia. With regards to future directions for this work, studies into childhood and adolescence years to assess if the subclinical echo findings observed in our study manifest as clinically relevant findings with increasing age, studies like this are essential for us to further explore this. It's also worth noting that there's a lack of international consensus available at present regarding the definition of pulmonary hypertension as diagnosed by echo surrogate markers. And there's a necessity to validate echo derived markers of pulmonary hypertension against the gold standard of right heart catheter measurements of pulmonary arterial pressure. And until then, the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension based off echocardiography surrogate markers will remain a challenge. Increased surveillance of infants and children with Down syndrome, particularly those with structurally normal hearts, is warranted. And the importance of continued basic science, examining the biological underpinnings of Down syndrome-associated morbidity and well-designed, adequately powered studies investigating safety and efficacy of emerging medications for the treatment of pulmonary hypertension in, in the Down syndrome population cannot be overstressed. So in conclusion, to the best of our knowledge, this study is the largest prospective study performed evaluating longitudinal myocardial function and pulmonary hemodynamics in infants with Down syndrome from birth to two years of age. Our results demonstrate impaired systolic and diastolic function and sustained abnormal elevation of pulmonary pressures, which is universal in infants with Down syndrome over their first two years of age, irrespective of structural cardiac disease. And this is nuance which is currently missing in available literature. So three takeaway points. Number one, pulmonary hypertension in Down syndrome is a heterogeneous entity resulting from multiple overlapping etiologies and places infants with Down syndrome at increased risk of both early and late pulmonary hypertension, regardless of structural cardiac disease. Two, longitudinal echocardiography has identified sustained ab abnormalities in indices of pulmonary hypertension in babies with Down syndrome compared to controls, irrespective of congenital heart disease, that do not normalize by two years of age. We see persistent early diastolic impairment in the Down syndrome cohort, which is contributing to their pulmonary hypertension phenotype. And thirdly, a greater awareness of such cardiorespiratory vulnerabilities in the neonatal and pediatric Down syndrome populations should be promoted. And monitoring put in place for all babies and children with Down syndrome, not only those with congenital heart disease. And finally, thank you so much, and especially to all of the beautiful children who took part in my research. And um, thank you to my sponsors and my supervisor, and I would very much welcome any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for that truly excellent talk. Um, I just want to pause briefly so I can reintroduce our panelist team and encourage again our viewers, please put any questions or comments into the chat for us. But to reintroduce our group that we have with us today, we have Dr. Nidhi Varghese, a pediatric pulmonologist, medical director of Texas Children's Pulmonary Hypertension Center. Um, Dr. Craig Fleischman is a pediatric cardiologist, echocardiologist, 
echocardiography expert um, who co-directs the Heart Center at Orlando Health Hospital for Children, and then Dr. Neil Patel, a neonatologist at the Royal Hospital for Children in Glasgow with expertise in pulmonary hypertension, hemodynamics, and CDH. Great. And I'll, uh, I'll kick off our discussion. I think uh, I have one question for uh, Dr. Smith, and then I'm going to pivot to uh, Dr. Fleischman. Dr. Smith, thank you so much for a fantastic talk. And uh, a full disclosure now, I did review a couple of those papers, and they were uh, excellent and uh, very glad that they made into those uh, journals. Um, my question for you is um, that a lot of the babies with Down syndrome who you know we see in the NICU and also on the regular postnatal ward, they're clinically well. And uh, a lot of the babies that you uh, perform these, these longitudinal echocardiography measurements, they were well at the time. They were in room air. They often went home on time. And so my question for you, and I hope it's not out of scope, is the, imp the clinical implications of these findings um, for most of our audience, which I think is predominantly neonatologists. Um, so I, I guess two parts. One is what are the clinical implications in the otherwise well baby with Down syndrome? where these echo findings are, there's clearly disparate findings between, amongst babies with Down syndrome and those who don't. And the second is that for the babies that, uh, no, the, for all the intensivists in the audience, what are the implications of these, obviously these measures of uh, impaired LV diastolic function in the clinical management of babies who have uh, clinical signs of pulmonary hypertension? Thank you so much. That's a, that's a jam-packed question. <laughs> so I suppose to give you a bit of context for the cohort of patients that I had in my study. So my I'd, my um, study excluded any patients with critical congenital heart disease or babies who had GI issues that, that necessitated immediate surgery because this the th I enrolled across three tier three maternity units in Dublin and their only maternity, their only maternity so any patients who need a pediatric cardiology, pediatric, pediatric cardiothoracic or GI surgeries, those patients were transported out and were not enrolled into this study. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that only 9% of the babies in my study were invasively ventilated and only 4% required nitric oxide. So my cohort is an incredibly healthy group of babies with Down syndrome that excluded critical GI and congenital heart disease infants. None of them needed prostin, for example, and um, only less than 10% were invasively ventilated and less than 5% required nitric. So they're quite a well cohort. In a way, that makes the findings even more interesting, if I may, because that it's so present, even in the children who appear to look so well. Um, in Ireland, we have a very high rate of Down syndrome, and that's an amalgamation of reasons, historically, culturally, etc. An earlier study that we did, just to give context about the, the health of the population, um, an earlier study that we did in our department showed that only 10% of babies born with Down syndrome did not require a neonatal unit admission. So about half of the babies came straight from the delivery suite because of immediate oxygen requirements, requirements for invasive ventilation, nitric, et cetera. And then another like 45% or so, 40% required admission later in their course, either for DSATs on the postnatal ward or oxygen, evolving oxygen requirements. So our unit in particular would have quite a proactive approach to looking after these babies with Down syndrome. All of the trainees are used to seeing if they have an oxygen requirement, just admit them and get on top of it quickly so they don't spiral. With regards to your question about the impact or the clinical implications of this, we didn't see any correlate between the children. That was a whole chapter in my thesis was we didn't see a correlate clinically between children who had higher markers of PV or, or worse function and, for example, hospital admissions or PICU admissions or anything like that. There could be a lot of reasons for that. Did I enroll a particularly healthy group of babies? Um, they had obviously a much higher hospital admission rate in comparison to controls. So over their first two years of age, 44% of these babies required a hospital admission for a lot of reasons. Some of them were for corrections of their congenital heart defects. Some of them were for pneumonias you know, feeding issues, 
developmental issues, etc. There was a myriad of issues. So yes, they had a higher hospital admission rate than a child who was born without Down syndrome, but we couldn't show that there was a correlate between worse PVOR or worse heart function. I think the issue is, and this is borne out in work that's already out and established, is that babies and children with Down syndrome have higher NICU and PICU admission rates. They have higher uh, likelihood of ending up on ECMO and they have a higher morbidity and mortality post ECMO than children without Down syndrome. So the cardiologists in Ireland that we work with and who have massive expertise in looking after infants and children with Down syndrome feel that the grumbling PVR that, and heart, fun heart dysfunction that a lot of these infants and children have they can kind of cope with a certain amount, but if they get a bronchiolitis, if they get an aspiration, if they get pneumonia, that's when they can spiral very, very quickly, end up in ICU, potentially ventilated, ECMO, et cetera. So I think really the biggest pointer from the study is showing that there is PVR there that's elevated beyond the newborn period all the way to two years of age. There's ongoing heart function issues. Your question about the clinical impact of that, I think it needs to be borne out over a longer period of time because I think the kids can probably cope a certain amount, but any additional insult could lead to hospital admissions. And unfortunately, my, my PhD had to end at some point. I couldn't follow them till they were like 10, <laughs> you know. Um, and then your question about the LV diastolic performance, um, that was definitely interesting to us. And obviously, as I've mentioned, their phenotype is multifactorial, but it's just another piece to it. What we saw was that the LV dimensions were persistently and significantly smaller in children with Down syndrome. So they have smaller left ventricles, physically smaller. And then obviously they whether, I mean, that is obviously related to the diastolic component too. They're probably stiffer, smaller, harder to fill, et cetera. And that all of that is, is a related issue. Um, there isn't a, enough research at the minute to investigate what therapies or what medications might be efficacious. After I finished my PhD, the next study we wanted to do was to, I, to do a study on sildenafil, early sildenafil um, in babies with Down syndrome. But unfortunately, we didn't get funding. So we need to try again um, to try and get funding because there isn't enough research into okay we've identified this problem is it amenable is, is it possible is it safe is it possible to change anything about this and does that impact anything at a year or two of age um but because it's down syndrome it can be a bit tricky and challenging to get funding for these studies so i hope that answered your question and please ask it again if there's anything i didn't address fully for you <laughs> No, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith. I do want to pivot and uh, uh, harness Dr. Fleischmann's expertise in, uh, in pediatric cardiology and the Echo Lab. Dr. Fleischmann, could you uh, elucidate for us and our audience um, in terms of do, do some of these differences that Dr. Smith's work has uh, have uncovered, do they play a role in your uh, post-discharge evaluation of babies with Down syndrome? and in the selection of pulmonary vasodilators for the small but significant minority of, of children who have Down syndrome end up developing clinically significant pulmonary arterial hypertension. First of all, um, fantastic data that you presented and have published. I think it it's um, you know really thought provoking and, and provides some uh, definitely roots for further for further research. Um, in terms of uh, how, one thing I would say that sort of adds on to what Ashling was was presenting is this early pH and late pH in, in infancy, and you have to recognize I'm really seeing the the when I uh, the next part I'm talking about are primarily patients with uh, congenital heart disease with a significant. Uh, uh, intracardiac shunt resulting usually in some degree uh, it, with, with uh, pulmon pulmonary arterial hypertension. And so if, if I use the example of someone with a, a complete atrioventricular canal defect, uh, by definition we'll have, if the VSD is large and there's no right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, by definition we'll have systemic pulmonary artery pressures. And what we do see are a subset of those. So many of those will, 
go on to develop uh, uh, signs and symptoms of significant left to right shunting as pulmonary vascular resistance typically falls in the first couple of months of life. And so they start, you start to see increased pulmonary blood flow with tachypnea, some interstitial pulmonary edema, left-sided heart enlargement, and so on and so on and so forth that, that really presents with the symptoms, especially if they're failing to thrive, may guide us in terms of early surgical intervention. But there's another group that really and clinically doesn't seem to have a fall in their pulmonary vascular resistance. So they have the large VSD, but they aren't developing, uh, while they have some degree of increased pulmonary blood flow, not nearly the, to the same extent where they may maintain normal left atrial size and left ventricular size. They aren't developing um, uh, pulmonary edema and tachypnea, and they aren't really having failure to thrive. And so we've, you know, so then the question becomes, well, are these safe? Are these babies safe to surgically close their their left to right shunt? And I think the uh, the the clinical experience and published data would say, as long as there's some net left to right shunt, it is safe to go ahead and, and close those VSDs. Although we will have uh, we'll have nitric oxide available in the operating suite to, to in in the case because they can have sort of a, a a reactive pulmonary vascular pulmonary vascular system uh, at at the when when the surgery is done and may have some risk of pulmonary hypertensive crises. So, um, you know, it, I guess my one question I had for Ashling is: there some way to predict which uh, which of the babies with Down syndrome have the late P pulmonary hypertension versus those that don't? And I'm talking about you know sort of the more clinically significant pH. So not from what we saw, it seemed to be like, of course, you know, over time, the kids who have the more, who are more hypotonic, who aspirate more, who have more chest infections, of course, that's more likely that they're going to end up with a chronic pulmonary hypertensive picture. But your question is from day one, can you predict? <laughs> and not, not from what we saw, um, because it seems that, they they all it seems to be inherent in the in their like endogenous lung tissue um and what you're saying i it's i actually didn't present it here but we looked into um if there was any differences in the pvor markers between the children with down syndrome and congenital heart disease those who went under surgery versus those who did not require surgery for their congenital heart defect and we saw no difference in the pvor measurements, no statistically significant difference. That's not to say, of course, that they shouldn't get their shunts closed or anything like that. Of course, they need to have their shunts closed. But I think it just emphasized that this is a multifactorial problem, that closing the shunt is not the be all and end all uh, to protecting the patient from evolving pulmonary hypertension, and that they all need to be looked at. And I think with more studies um, looking into it, if you had more data with bigger numbers, you probably could delve into the different phenotypes of the groups. Um, but we did find that interesting when we did a subgroup analysis of the Downs with congenital heart disease and split them into those who had surgery versus who didn't. Um, so again, I hope that kind of answered your question, but I, I think there's still a lot of questions that need to be addressed from the research and hopefully over time we'll explore it further. Thank you. Sorry, Danny, was there another, I forget, I think there might've been another part to your question. Uh, thanks, there, there was, but I, I'll, uh, you did mention something that I wanted to touch on with you is what the babies who have AVSD, I know you've done a lot of work on uh, pulmonary artery banding and uh, um, when, when do you consider that and how do you, try and extract kind of in, um, intrinsic uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension because of congenital factors or uh, you know, structural or anthropometric differences versus flow-mediated pulmonary hypertension. So I think those are kind of two questions, the role of PA bending in yeah. the babies who have AVSD and then differentiating flow versus anthropometric or congenital uh, contributions to pulmonary hypertension. Yeah, 
So I think we do the PA banning on those patients who probably have more complex heart disease or and are at higher risk to begin with, because I mean, if you look at the data, then the ones who have had a pulmonary artery ban have worse outcomes overall as it relates to their congenital heart disease. But in general, we basically, you know, the way we approach it, and we just had one, our most recent one was just this past week is the, uh, or past couple of weeks was, is, is a patient who require, who has multiple defects, um, including an AVSD. Uh, and, and the issue with the AVSD is most everything else we can treat surgically, even in the first month of life with neonatal heart surgery, it becomes very problematic before, say, about three months of age to, to really operate effectively on the AV valves uh, and, and to septate, divide and septate the, the heart and, and, and form two separate AV valves uh, by, just by nature of the tissue that the surgeons are working with. And so typically, if, you know, most most places will shy away from doing AVSD repair before three months of age. You know, there may, depending on the size of the baby, that may be a little bit lower. So what if you have a patient with AVSD and critical coarctation of the aorta or, um, or even, or a, and, and a discrete coarctation? So that's a patient where we would correct the coarctation because they're dependent on prostaglandin. And then also, that's the point, though, because anyone who, so for instance, who's had coarctation surgery tends to have a worsening of their left to right shunt. You never really have an optimal aorta after, after surgical repair that they tend to become symptomatic. And those are the ones that for, that's, a, that's one some group that would require a pulmonary artery ban. Um, in general, it's those who require neonatal surgery for something that can't wait beyond the neonatal period that in, inevitably will worsen the remaining left to right, the, the remaining shunt, intracardiac shunt, and therefore the need to try and control pulmonary blood flow. Part of that is to decrease the symptoms, but also part of that is to uh, hopefully protect the pulmonary vasculature from both high, the combination of high pressure and high flow. Thanks, Dr. Fleischman. Um, Dr. Reese, I'd like to address you next. I'm kind of following up both uh, Dr. Weiss's and Dr. Fleisch Fleischman's questions about identifying late pH. Um, in your center, are you seeing the phenotype that Dr. Smith described in your patients with Down syndrome? I was kind of wondering both about your approach to screening and management. And there's a question in the chat about um, for how long should you monitor for pH and structurally normal heart, perhaps with patients with Down syndrome? I don't know if that's something that you're addressing or treating differently in your center. Great. Thank you so much. I'm happy to address those. And I want to also just add my kudos to Dr. Smith. It was a phenomenal talk and I took a lot of notes and <laughs> there was really, really well done. Thank you. Um, you know, the Down syndrome population is unbelievably heterogeneous, as you noted, and we see these kind of peaks in presentation. So there are a number that present early with very fulminant disease, um, often related with congenital heart disease or perhaps a PPHN that never seems to quite go away uh, with a very delayed transition. And many of those were able to identify, treat, um, typically with mono or dual therapy, and then um, they're able to kind of convalesce. And many of them may even be able to get off therapy. But then we see the second peak somewhere around four to five or kind of early school age when sleep, sleep sort of breathing becomes a bigger issue as the, um, the oral cavity changes, as growth changes, et cetera. And we address that quickly. American Academy of Pediatrics has a recommendation that all babies, uh, all children with Down syndrome must be screened by the age of four with a sleep study. So I, in my practice, tried to do a sleep study somewhere between two and four to get um, a, a handle on that ahead of time before it becomes a big issue. And of course, there's a lot of big need for anticipatory guidance for weight management and healthy sleep practices so we can identify clinical symptoms before they come. But what I found so interesting with your talk today is that there's this third spike that we see that's not really well understood. And this third spike we tend to see somewhere around adolescence. Um, sometimes it may be related to congenital heart disease. The, the integrity of the repair has now changed. If you have an AV canal, for example, perhaps the left AV valve is more stenotic or more, more regurgitant both of which can have significant impact downstream to the right heart. Uh, but then you have others who 
their hearts look good, the, rather the left heart looks good, their sleep apnea is not an issue, and yet we've had this third spike. And I'm as I as we were speaking, I'm taking notes here, and I'm wondering how many of those children, if we were to go back and look at their echoes from when they were infants and neonates, how many of them already showed us this change in diastology that may actually be an ongoing factor. So I think understanding that phenotype is unbelievably important because I struggle with a number of children with trisomy 21 who are now somewhere between 12 to 17 and have pretty severe pH that seems to be progressive, almost acting like an idiopath, requiring more single, dual, triple therapy. And it seems to be progressive. I can't quite understand why it's progressive. And so we do genetics on these patients to see could they have trisomy 21 plus something else. Uh, and so in clinical practice, I think that becomes a big, a big question because I can't anticipate what's going to happen to this pH. Right. If I have a four-year-old Down syndrome with sleep disorder breathing and severe OSA, I know if I work on the OSA, the sleep disorder breathing is no longer an issue. The pH often is stable or resolves. But now I have a 15-year-old who is getting worse and I'm kind of maxing out on therapies. And now we're talking about, do we do pot shunt? Do we do a lung transplant? What are our options? And so to be able to anticipate the progression of disease, I think is very important. And the work that you're doing is extremely interesting to me because I wonder if some of these patients, if we identify them who are at risk of having issues later in life, should we kind of, for lack of a better word, to, or lack of a better description, take their pH a little bit more seriously in infancy and have them on dual therapy from the, from the get-go. I don't know if I can do upfront combination therapy with three drugs from the gate, but maybe, you know, keep these kids on dual therapy and not, not tell them like, oh, things are fine. Keep my card if you need me. You know, and so I, I wonder if we need to um, identify this particular vulnerable group and be more anticipatory with our screening and more anticipatory with our um, with our medication management. So I was curious. I have a question back for you. If I've answered if I've answered your question enough, Dr. Highland, um, my question back for you, um, Dr. Smith, is: Do you think that there is a benefit in having a specific screening protocol for echocardiography? Um, specific to Down syndrome. You know, there are a lot of um, protocols that we talk about for many, many individual groups and Down syndrome, of course, already has many protocols in place when it comes to assessment by echo, like when to do echo. But are there, are you advocating that there are certain other measurements that we do not routinely do that they should become kind of part of a uh, regular screening process? Yeah, so I mean, in response to the findings from our study in Ireland, we're updating our national policy. Um, so at present, every baby born with Down syndrome in Ireland, either antenatally or postnatally diagnosed, the expectation is that they should have an echo in the first week of age to rule out structural disease, obviously in the context of a clinically well patient. Um, and if at the minute, if that heart echo was structurally normal, they're discharged into the ether but now as the result of the study uh the pediatric or our national pediatric cardiology center wants to implement i think uh they, they're still discussing it because obviously it has um resource implications they're discussing the frequency of how often to follow up the structurally normal ones they're thinking maybe every two to three years just to routinely bring these children into a pediatric cardiology uh clinic um, I saw one of the questions in the Q&A was who should follow these patients. I mean, for me, it should be pediatric cardiology. Um, like we are not like we're neonatologists who perform hemodynamic assessments and not structural or ongoing pediatric cardiology. So that for me should be pediatric cardiology, but that has resource implications. With regards to a specific protocol, I mean, the measurements that I described there for pulmonary vascular resistance, they're quite easily obtained, like pulmonary artery acceleration time and left ventricular eccentricity index, they're quite easy to obtain. Um, the more quote unquote sophisticated ones like, like deformation analysis, their benefit lies in the fact that they are the most sensitive. They, they will pick up subtle changes in systolic and diastolic performance before most like most likely before tissue Doppler will or more crude measurements like um like pulse wave inflows 
um, on the tricuspid or mitral valve. So they have a benefit there. I mean, they're not like you can train people to do them. They're not particularly mystifying. Um, but again, it boils down to people's expertise. Um, I have seen protocols in other countries whereby Down syndrome clinics are centralized. Um, so that obviously a lot of these patients, as you've made reference to, they have endocrine issues, respiratory issues, developmental issues, and that ends up building up a lot of appointments for these families and these children who, of course, you want to keep in school and all of their regular activities. So some countries actually have centralized clinics that the parents and the child can come and they see ENT, respiratory, cardiology, anyone that they need to see all at once. And that's a very patient centered approach. In Ireland, we have Down syndrome clinics um, they specifically started over the last few years, but there's still more of a developmental focus on them an MDT input that the child might need like physio, OT, et cetera, as opposed to necessarily a medical. But I think over time we will be pushing for that because it's um it's a large burden on parents to come to all of these appointments as well. So to answer your question, I think there is merit in having a specific Down syndrome protocol provided that there's um support for the people carrying it out and that there's um kind of good networks and patients pathways to the specialists that are required um and balancing that out with it with it not being too burdensome on the patients and the families involved thanks dr smith um i actually want to ask a tough question to dr patel um kind of as we keep talking about frequent reassessments in this vulnerable population that has abnormal cardiac maturation it's making me think of dr patel's um clinical and research area of cdh patients and i'm wondering if you can translate any of what dr smith and dr Vigis were also saying about the need for maybe scheduled early intervention scheduled early inter, uh, inter um, follow-up and what you might suggest for that group or what you see differently in those patients as well yeah thank, thanks very much rachel and thanks very much ashley that was an amazing talk and and the 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 amount of work that i know went into to, co to collecting that and analyzing it as well it's just brilliant and inspiring and i was definitely thinking the same thing you know difficult for me in my brain to separate out cdh from anything but i just saw so many parallels um i think in particular this understanding that you've shone a light on in, in terms of the left heart and its role and the and interventricular interactions that you're that you're able to describe there and um, one thought that i had around that that early pulmonary hypertension pieces and your description of it as a as the left heart driving the the elevated pulmonary vascular resistance and therefore the changes in the right heart and it it, it made me wonder whether you'd thought that actually treatment in the, in this population should be thinking not just about um the precapillary circulation and the pulmonary arterial tone but also the left heart um because that's definitely something that in CDH we're slowly coming around to thinking about as well um, so maybe that's a, a, a question I can ask to you first, and then I'll, I'll come back to the to the question again. Yeah, I suppose like as I as I mentioned, like the etiology in pulmonary hypertension is so heterogeneous. So I think it's there just isn't the data. Like we don't know. Like our next study that we wanted to do was sildenafil, early sildenafil, to see if that would be helpful. But actually, I mean, if you want to target diastolic, then maybe something that lowers the heart rate, you know, maybe mm -hmm. that would have a, a bigger impact. Um, but, but we just don't know. And also it's about, as mentioned, if there is different etiologies, then to be safe and to be as precise as possible to try and pick the right drug for the right patient at the right time. You know, I think we probably still have a bit of work to do to pull out the different phenotypes um, and as best you can try and use medication to target the appropriate phenotype at the appropriate time, as opposed to just throwing a lot of medications at a patient um, that they might not be beneficial. So targeting specifically left diastolic dysfunction in a Down syndrome cohort would be incredibly interesting to see if that would help over time. I don't know that we're just quite there yet mm -hmm. I think I'd, I'd like a bit more research before before doing that but I did think the sildenafil would have been an interesting option if we got the funding <laughs> so we need to keep trying to get some funding because I think that that would be incredibly helpful and it will be really interesting as well because say if you did give sildenafil from an early date 
and you follow them over time, then maybe it will be if efficacious at reducing PVOR, but then the next question would be, okay, does reducing the PVOR actually have a clinically positive impact, A? And then if the LV diastolic is impairment is more of an issue, does the sildenafil have an impact in that situation or does it does it help a little bit or is it is the impact slightly diluted? You know, it, I think it's it's interesting and we're only just starting to figure it out. Yeah. Great, thanks very much. I see Dr. Dr. Fleischman's hand up actually, maybe you want to come in there. Yeah, I wanted to jump in on the, the diastolic dysfunction. The problem is in pediatrics in general, we really don't know what to do about diastolic dysfunction. Number one, we, you know, this isn't the same as uh, adults with heart failure with preserved left ventricular function, right? And so it's a very heterogeneous group to start with. And, wor and worse than that, we really don't have anything to treat it with. And so, you know, perhaps some diuretics, uh, for, you know, for, for symptoms, you know, I worry sometimes I, I can envision a situation where sildenafil could make things worse. If you have increased pulmonary blood flow into a stiff left ventricle, it just about, you know, it, it, that, that can, um, I mean, not, not the most common scenario, but certainly, you know, a possibility. And so that's the, uh, the issue of, of, trying to decide what to do with diastolic dysfunction in the first place, uh, whether, especially when you're identifying it in the, the neonatal population where we know there, yes, that I, and, and you had, you showed the differences between the newborn, the normal newborns and, and those with trisomy 21, but we also know the normal newborns aren't, nor, don't, don't have normal diastolic function either. And so, um, you know, I, I think to evaluate it and, and mark that is important. And the question becomes how that plays into the the the, the adolescent appearance of, of pulmonary hypertension, and that that potentially is if there was some way to to uh, prevent that from progressing to that severity, that would be a, a benefit of early identification. Thanks, Dr. Fleischman. I, I want to bring this back to Neil. I know. The, the neonatal intensivists in the room, uh, no one's mentioned it, but obviously milrinone comes to mind, of course, with uh, LV uh, systolic or diastolic dysfunction in the context of uh, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, do we have, given the parallels, the, anthrop the anthropometric um, parallels with the CDH population and the Down syndrome population, is there any insight from the CDH population about something like milrinone for, these are the sick babies with Down syndrome who have clinical pulmonary hypertension and hypoxic, hypoxemic respiratory failure, any insights from the CDH population and uh, something like milrinone, where we suspect they may have an intrinsic or sometimes measurable um, LV diastolic dysfunction? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I suspect I'd be interested in people's thoughts, but I suspect people who are, who are on the webinar, who've got experience of managing those babies with Down syndrome and with diaphragmatic hernia, when they're having when they're in a, a phase of clinical compromise where we think there's pulmonary hypertension and or left heart dysfunction, I've got some experience of using milrinone in those situations. We don't have a strong amount of published evidence to, to support that use, but I think the clinical use it exceeds you know, the, the evidence that we have. And certainly we, we've been using milrinone in those populations, especially diaphragmatic hernia population for quite some time now. Um, the... There's the milrinone trial in CDH that has been run multi-center in, in North America, led by Dr. Lakshman Rasima, and we're really, you know, interested to see what that will will yield. The, as you guys probably sense as well from your clinical experience, I kind of think of milrinone as a kind of general tonic. In theory, it's going to address a lot of problems here, isn't it? Pulmonary vasodilator, uh, systemic vasodilator, so that might support the failing or the the troubled left heart. Um, positive inotropes so improve systolic function that, that uh, Ashling has showed in these in particularly in the right ventricle in these patients um positive lucitrope so to support diastolic function one of the few drugs that we think does that um so in theory yeah drug that we, we, we that we hope is going to have this 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 holistic approach on this failing circulation and on the different components that Ashling has shown in diaphragm in, in down syndrome as we see in CDH in reality, my sense is that it's a it's a gentle friend. You know, you start it. We we don't use it. We don't use it with a loading dose because it was worried about you know excessive systemic vasodilatation and making blood pressure worse in these patients. 
and then we kind of sit back but but don't necessarily see a dramatic response does it contribute to general stabilization we kind of hope so but i think that's more of a clinical experience rather than something that we've got you know um a lot of data to support but we know that these are drugs that, that are used widely especially in the cdh cohort and i suspect in 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 the PICU situation in those patients with Down, Down syndrome who are having those acute exacerbations, whether post cardiac surgery or with a infective respiratory uh, um, ac acute deterioration as well. But interested in what other people's experiences. Just to jump back because it was another point that really interested me in in the parallels between potentially Down syndrome and CDH that you mentioned, Ashling, is the small left ventricle because that's again something that we've kind of picked up on or revisited. It's been described in CDH in the fetal heart on post-mortem and ultrasound studies. And more recently, some really nice work from uh, Fleur and Kip Mueller and colleagues in, in uh, uh, Bonn in Germany, where they've looked at their RVLV ratio on in the in, in the first assessment of, of CDH babies and shown a relationship with with uh, outcome in those babies. And I just wondered if if what what your thoughts were about that that small left ventricle is it a developmental phenomenon is it or is it just compression by the septal deviation i think it's there from birth yeah like they they seem to have smaller lvs and whether the reasons for that overlap with the cdh is like if they're getting if if even in utero there's less blood flow coming back into the left side and that's somehow contributing or over time then it's also superimposed with septal bowing in the more severe cases but yeah it's definitely interesting and it was there and um and and in the whole cohort not even those kids who only had structural issues so um and, and, and surely contributing to the diastolic issues that they have um so yeah it's just another interesting finding I, I don't I could stand to be corrected I'd have to look and see if there's much with regards to fetal assessment of LV dimensions in fetally identified T21s. Um, but that will be another interesting study <laughs> to do, <laughs> to see. Um, yeah, but I but I think it's a con it's a combination. I think it's from I think it's there from birth and then probably gets impacted with age as well if there's ongoing PVR issues and the ORV bowing. Thanks, Dr. Smith. Uh, there, was, there was a question in the chat just to tie up this last, I think we'll do one last uh uh, thread on diastology. I want to echo Dr. Fleischman's uh, comments that, um, you know, in pediatrics, certainly even more so in neonates, thresholds for the diagnosis of uh, HEFPEF or heart, func heart, func heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or diastolic failure, there's nothing in neonates at all. A little bit from uh, Kurt DeWall in Australia, he was kind of the first one to look at um, diastolic heart failure, trying to diagnose that. But for the critically ill baby, I'll, I'll ask Neil and then maybe. Uh, Dr. Fleischman, in the uh, pediatric population, um, I'll go to you second. Are there demonstrable or identifiable thresholds where we can say this is diastolic dysfunction, and uh, this is a this is a child that requires uh, some alteration in therapy besides pulmonary arterial vasodilators uh, to to ameliorate their you know, critical condition? So, why don't we start with Dr. Patel? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I I think for the left ventricular diastolic function, I I would say this is some of the first work that's really shining a light on a specific condition where where we're seeing this. And yeah, we're not. I don't think we're anywhere near yet a stage of absolutely defining thresholds. As we've been talking about, this is such a heterogeneous disease. There are different phenotypes of cardiac dysfunction. Um. And also, from a practical point of view, we don't have a single echocardiographic parameter that that there's consensus that we could use to make that definition. So I think it's it's a it's there's a level of um, experience, expertise, and art probably in deciding whether you think a patient has significant diastolic dysfunction that correlates with their clinical, um, you know, their clinical phenotype, and therefore merits treatment because, you know. If you may identify it on echocardiography, including the use of deformation in diseases, as Ashling's shown. But if the patient in front of you looks entirely well, then I think you've got to really ask yourself, what are you treating? You know, yes, uh, you know, Dr. Vergesi mentioned that may that may very much give you a warning sign. This is a patient you want to follow really closely. 
and monitor their clinical their clinical progress. But I think we've got to be really cautious about not just treating an echo ind index or an abnormal number, but the whole patient in, in the context of that. And I think that that's as exactly as Ashim said, there's, you know, really, you know, interesting areas for, for lots more investigation. And the same goes for the right side of the heart, I suspect as well. Yeah, it's it, my my kind of, I suppose, clinical practice is to say, yeah, that look, that heart's giving me a warning and I need to be really vigilant here. But unless there's a clear correlate or I'm seeing a clear correlate with clinical instability, then why would I rush in with a, a medication that is going to have adverse effects, side effects, burden for the patient? Thank you so much, Dr. Fleischman. Um, I would agree with, with what Neil said. I, I think we've gotten very good at uh, different echocardiographic tools to evaluate both systolic and diastolic function, you know, having gone from a tissue Doppler now to deformation. And so we can we can measure it really well. Um, I think though it, it comes back to how do we interpret the data? Again, as was mentioned, very heterogeneous population, even outside of, of you know, Down syndrome. Uh, and, and again, when you're talking about no real targeted therapies to, you know, to, to, to offer, now you're, you know, you're sort of one, one or two steps away from the actual uh, uh, process that's, that's leading to the diastolic dysfunction. You know, I think we're seeing, you know, in the ultimate diastolic dysfunction, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, you know, where the uh, you have abnormal myosin chains, you have severe left ventricular hypertrophy, clearly with, with diastolic dysfunction. Now, it's only been just real recent where we have medical therapy, pharmacologic therapy to treat uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where the measurement tools really come into play, because now we can measure the effect that 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 our treatment is having on that. But again, that's a very targeted therapy that, that's, that's taking place. But I think that's where, you know, if we can, if, and, and, you know, we, we need to do better as a cardiology community to sort of define, you know, have some gui more, more overall guidelines for assessment of diastolic function and more importantly, what to do with that information. Thank you, Dr. Smith. If I may, I, I think um, the point about the thresholds about diastolic dysfunction and when do we call it abnormal or where on the spectrum it lies, the same can be said for our echo surrogates of pulmonary vascular resistance, because like PAAT has been validated in pediatric patients. That was like Phil Levy's work against right heart catheter measurements, but obviously for practical reasons, et cetera, which I fully accept like PAT has not been validated against a right heart catheter measurement in a neonate, nor has LVEI, nor has the official thresholds been agreed upon internationally amongst expert panels with regards to what exact PAT or what exact LVEI do you take to be the pathological threshold? Like the LVEI of 1.8, we derived that because it was that was higher than two standard deviations of what we saw in our control cohort. Like no, nobody has even talked about what threshold to use for LVEI. We derived it from our control cohort and we're very clear in our documentation that that's where it's come from, but it's not, it's not been validated. So that like that throws up a bigger issue of like, yes, we have these fantastic techniques and it's and it's excellent but it throws up a lot of questions like what the other speakers are talking about about what do we do with that information where do we draw the threshold for what's pathological or what's within the spectrum of normal and then I couldn't agree with Neil and Craig's points about first of all our first tenant of being a physician is do no harm you know you don't want to be into in instigating therapies or medications to patients who do not need them or actually might be a disadvantage and I think the overall point I think from our work that we've done I suppose has highlighted the vulnerabilities of this group and hopefully has just shone a little bit of a light onto that they need to be followed but actually a lot more work is needed for us to fully understand their phenotypes fully understand the thresholds of when we need to intervene and then a lot of work needs to go into how best to help them once we have identified a problem. So I couldn't agree more with the points that have been brought up by the other speakers and 
And the final thing I would say is that there has to be very close collaboration with pediatric cardiology in, in a lot of these patients because um, we are neonatologists. So our expertise lies in the newborn and especially for any pediatric structural issue or you know any evolving pulmonary hypertensive issue, it's absolutely vital to have the support of pediatric cardiologists um, to ensure that we're practicing in a safe um, in a safe way. Thanks, Dr. Smith. Um, and as you kind of just said, uh, how do we intervene when we do identify a problem? Um, there was a question in the chat about therapeutics, and obviously it's a very heterogeneous population, but um, Dr. Verghese actually was wondering if you had any comments on how you would generally approach this population, or if there's a, even um, as far as intensity goes, I know you're part of a clinical trial, I think, looking at um, combination therapies versus single therapy approach and whether you think that could be applicable in this population or other special populations, CDH, et cetera. Sure. Um, before I answer that, I wanted to add one more point to what Dr. Smith was saying. I think the collaboration with um, pediatric cardiology is very important. I would add that the, the general pediatrician, I think, is really where, where this information needs to go the pediatric cardiologists and even the pediatric pulmonologists, we only see the patients who are referred to us or that we know about. So it's very easy to uh, lose one of these patients until you find the pediatrician has been going through so much workup and can't find anything else and finally does an echo or finally does a chest x-ray and realizes, oh my goodness. And so I think there is a there is an extremely important responsibility that we as subspecialists have to our general colleagues to educate them on what, um, what to look for, when to refer, and um, with whom to partner. So I want to add that piece into that. Um, regarding medication therapy, um, as a pH expert, I, I'm actually a doctor who tries to, I try to do everything I can to not prescribe pH therapy. <laughs> and part of it is because it's my uh, belief that most of pulmonary hypertension, especially in pediatrics, much of it has to do with other factors. And I think when we are quick to prescribe therapy, we miss the opportunity to identify modifiable variables, such as sleep disorder breathing or severe restrictive lung disease, perhaps restrictive cardiomyopathies, et cetera. And so it's extremely important to rule everything out first. And so that's what my first treatment is actually full workup and evaluation. Now, of course, if the child is clinically unstable, well, then I have to do something to buy time. And so stability can be achieved either sometimes with just single therapy or sometimes um, dual or triple therapy, combination of inhaled, especially if there is a strong lung component to the disease. Uh, I will favor inhaled therapies, particularly on the inpatient side. And so we, we use a variety of inhaled short acting agents on the inpatient side where it's relatively easy to access. Um, but we'll try to just do, you know, optimize everything else first. And then if that doesn't work, depending on the age of the patient and what they're able to take, what they're able to tolerate, I typically will start with simple oral therapies first and really try to maximize those before reaching for more of the continuous infusions, just because they're onerous and the developmental stage of the child with trisomy 21 may, um, may be challenging to manage and um, just deal with a continuous infusion. So we try, we do try to do um, um, initial agents with oral therapy first. Now, whether you do a single versus a duo, that is, as you alluded to, one of the studies that we have ongoing right now in North America is our mod pa study, our mono or duo therapy in pulmonary arterial hypertension. And um, whether to choose one or two at the beginning is hard to say, and uh, we don't know, you know, so right now it's very, it's very, I think, physician dependent and experience dependent, and also depends a lot on how, on the severity of the illness, which is why I think Dr. Smith's work is so interesting because if sometimes uh, what, of course, what I'm understanding is that the clinical severity may not look so bad, right? The phenotype may not be, may not completely belie the genotype that's underneath or the, um, just the myocardial changes that we're not expecting yet. So, um, so I don't know. That's a very long-winded answer to, <laughs> to say. You know, when you do start with one therapy or two, and I, I, the answer is I don't know. Um, it really is very case by case. I don't think that we can prescribe and say children with Down syndrome should automatically be on two therapies. I think that is um, simplifying a very heterogeneous group, and I think that does a disservice to the diversity of this population. Um, but I think the one of the key takeaways that I would 
take from this is that the importance of really looking at everything else. Um, you know, is are, is there heart disease? Is there actually another mutation? Is there a developmental lung disorder? Is there sleep disorder breathing? So I think the importance and the responsibility is on the full workup and, um, and to do a full evaluation to really help then guide therapy. Thanks, Dr. Varghese. Uh, there are a couple of very specific questions in the chat, but we'll take advantage of our panelists and speakers' expertise to try and tackle these. So the first one I'll send to Dr. Smith. Uh, I'm not sure if, this, if the question is really about Down syndrome uh, in particular, but the question really is about, I guess, when you have multiple contributors to pulmonary hypertension, whether it be Down syndrome, but associated with intrauterine growth restriction and the, you know, the vascular changes associated with that, does that alter the approach to diagnosis and management of children who develop uh, clinical pulmonary hypertension? Acute pulmonary, like acute in the neonatal period, immediate yeah. pulmonary hypertension. I mean, for me, it's always history, examination, initial investigations, and an echo. And um, and you need to take every patient, I think, on a case-by-case -case basis and just integrate those risk factors into your thought process for the patient. Um, and as with all acute pulmonary hypertension, ventilation is so important, making sure you have appropriate ventilation. Um, if you x-ray, you're treating sepsis, surfactant deficiency, all of those things. Ideally, if you have access to an echo and a hemodynamic assessment, that can be very helpful. But just to not get overwhelmed by the situation and to understand that there's a colossal amount that you can do for your patient uh, before you even have an echo probe in your hand um, by simply doing a very thorough history examination, chest x-ray, just the basics, get the basics right. Um, and then obviously um, getting expertise for if you have a concern for a structural cardiac lesion in the initial period with a, a cyanotic infant is obviously so important. But the specific question about whether a certain phenotype of neonate is going to change my management. I mean, diaphragms are a complete, they're a different cohort of patients that require their own specific things to, to consider. But outside of that, whether it's a acute pulmonary hypertension because of a meconium asp or because of a congenital pneumonia or a Down syndrome, I think the approaches are often the same. Um, a logical approach and looking after ventilation, CO2 clearance, oxygenation, blood pressure management, ruling out sepsis and getting a hemodynamic assessment and ruling out structural cardiac disease. Those will always be the tenets of your approach in the immediate few hours to pulmonary hypertension in my opinion. Thanks, Dr. Smith, that's fantastic. We have one last question, which I'll send to Dr. Fleischman, if that's okay. This is it's quite a specific question, but amongst um, uh, babies with Down syndrome who have an AV canal defect uh, and associated RV dysfunction, is there a role for digoxin? Um, <clears throat> I think that's gonna vary from practitioner to practitioner. Uh, I have found You'll find some who will add, usually we'll start with a diuretic and then we may use Digox. And I haven't, you know, I haven't had trouble with using it. Uh, and oftentimes with those who are having heart failure from pulmonary overcirculation, it can um, be helpful in terms of getting them uh, a little better with feeding. Um, whether it's specifically for right ventricular dysfunction, uh, for, you know, it's hard to tell sometimes because both ventricles are contributing to the cardiac output before the repair in a uh, AV septal defect, you know, it is, is the right ventricle, is the function down or perhaps is it hypoplastic uh, and, and just doesn't look as large as the, as the LV and perhaps it's an unbalanced canal. But in general, I think different, it, it, it certainly can be used. Um, I, I don't know that it's necessarily commonly used. Uh, really depends on a uh, practitioner or sometimes center uh, individual centers will have their own practice. Thanks, Dr. Fleischman. And thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for to our participants for joining us. This has really been a wonderful discussion. Um, hugely thankful to our moderators and our um, panelists and to Dr. Smith, our presenter today. Um, if you could, you could please complete the evaluation um, of the session that Laura put in the chat. And we look forward to saving everyone at the next conference. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.